science of their day, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So we need some background information first. Um, hopefully, many of you all have read on fairy stories. If you haven't, you really should. But Tolkien says that he not only liked fairy stories as a young child, but such things as history, astronomy, botany, grammar, and etymology. And he lets us know that fantasy does not make you stupid. I think we all know that, right? You cannot do good fantasy unless you think carefully about it. So fantasy does not belong to the opposite for or obscure the perception of scientific verity. the misuse of science. Remember the ominous P word. What's the ominous P word? Power. Power. That's where he's worried about science being misused. Lewis also knew a lot about the natural world. If you haven't read The Discarded Image, his great treatise about the beauty of the geocentric medieval universe, please do so. I put up If you read The Abolition of Man or That Hideous Rank, told, uh, Lewis was concerned that it was the only way to study the world. He was very worried about, again, ethics and science. Okay? So things that we're not going to have time to cover are, for Tolkien, his observations of the night sky, his references to geology, uh, some of his little thoughts about evolution, body and birth and death of the universe. Some of these I've talked about in other places. In terms of Lewis, we're not going to talk about the surface of Mars or how you travel in space or the night sky or the birth and death of the universe or parallel dimensions. So what am I going to talk about? There's just so much to talk about. What I want to first, again, leave you with one final disclaimer here is that both of these men knew that they were writing fantasy. And they both knew that their science was not 100% correct. Now, Lewis was very happy with this. And when he was criticized for his science, he wrote back that he needed for his purpose just enough popular astronomy to create in the common reader a willing suspicion of disbelief. He knew that some of his science was wrong, and he just didn't care. Tolkien fixated on this like he fixated on most things. And specifically, he realized over the years that it was very unsatisfactory moving from a flat Earth to a round Earth and having the sun and the moon be created after the world had been around for many, many millennia. So while and after writing The Lord of the Rings, he tried to sort of fix his cosmology. Uh, in Morgoth's ring, there's something called the Ainu Lindale Sea Star, which is a version of the cosmology where the, the sun and the moon were created about the same time as the Earth, and the Earth was always around. And he also wrote essays called that uh, Christopher Tolkien packages as something called Mist Transform, where Tolkien tries to come up with a round earth cosmology. It doesn't work. It really just ruins the poetic nature of it. Thankfully, he never took that any step further. So what Tolkien eventually sort of said was, well, you can't really take these myths seriously because they were written down by men, passed down by the men of Numenor. The elves knew that the earth wasn't flat. The, the, earth, the elves knew that the sun and the moon really weren't created from the two trees. So Lewis said, my science is wrong. I don't care. Tolkien tried to figure out a way within his sub-creation to make it work. It tells you something about those two men. So what I'm going to discuss briefly is Lewis and Tolkien's use of time travel, extraterrestrial life, the planet Venus, meteorites, case of Tolkien only, I'm going to talk about the origin of the moon, and in the case of Lewis, the evolution of the sun, and tie these in with the scientific knowledge of their day. So, time travel, an inconvenient truth. Einstein's special theory of relativity in 1905 gave us E equals mc squared, which gives us nuclear power, also gives us nuclear weapons, not his fault. 
But one of the things that comes out of Einstein's special theory of relativity is that the speed of light is the ultimate speed limit of the universe. With all due respect to Gene Roddenberry, you cannot travel warp five, according to the special theory of relativity. Now, could you imagine Star Trek if it took them 10 years to go between planet to planet? I think that everybody on the Enterprise would kill each other before they got somewhere. So in science fiction and fantasy, we tend to ignore this inconvenient truth and say that you can get from here to there as fast as Varys does. Like that. <laughs> but 10 years later, Einstein came up with a fuller version of his model, something called the general theory of relativity. And this was a discussion about the nature of space and time as a four-dimensional fabric called, you ready for this, space-time. Three dimensions of space, one dimension of time, interwoven, and the bending of space and time by the presence of a massive object like the sun is what we call gravity. So the Earth orbits the sun, not because of this mystical Newtonian attraction, but because the sun works space time and the Earth just travels the best it can. So that was the main science of the day. In Einstein's model, time is a little strange but you can only go forward. Or can you go back in time? In 1949, Kurt Gödel discovered that there were, within Einstein's models, under very special conditions, ways that you could time travel back into the past. And this is something called the Gödel model. The only catch here is that the universe has to rotate. And there's absolutely no evidence that the universe does this. So it was a mathematical curiosity and nothing more. Right? So you can have backward-directed time travel in Einstein's model. It's just rather difficult. Well, some people didn't like that. One of the people who didn't like that was J.W. Dunn, who was an aerospace engineer. And he realized, like many people do, that some of his dreams appeared to come true. And he went to do a scientific experiment to see if he could explain why this happened. And from this experiment with his dreams, he discovered this new model of time. He believed that dreams were allowing us to access a higher dimension of time. And that in dreams, we sort of connect with this higher level of observation, and on this higher level of observation of time, you can move forward or backward any way you want. His first book was 1927, An Experiment with Time. He wrote three other books, The Serial Universe, The New Immortality, and Nothing Dies. He, ex he expanded his model to say that not only was there one higher dimension of time, but there was a dimension of time higher and higher and higher, an infinite number until you reached the ultimate time and ultimate observer or supermind, which you could consider the mind of God. And even though we die here in this one level of observation where we only go like a train forward, in higher dimensions of time, we never die. That's what he considered immortality. Okay? Now, this idea of having higher dimensions of time is really nothing new. There have been higher dimensional theories both before Einstein and after Einstein, for example, string theory. So that by itself does not make this unscientific. But Dunn's model denied Einstein's work. And it does not hold up to scientific scrutiny. Nevertheless, it was very popular in a certain segment of the population. Some philosophers, some psychologists, and a number of writers really glommed onto this as a way of possibly beating Einstein and being able to travel back in time. Among those who really glommed onto this idea was Olaf Stapleton. Olaf Stapleton has three main novels of this sort of time travel, space travel bent. The Last and First Men and The Last Men in London, which both deal with, over the millennia, 18 different species of humans who try to cheat death. Of course, the human species has to die out at the end of the book. I won't give the ending away. <laughs> but what happens is that these men learn how to, in dreams, access Dunn's model and travel back in time to talk to us, the first men, and they're the last men, the 18th species. 
in the book, The Star Maker, he, the, he uses this same, his character uses this same sort of disembodied dream travel to travel throughout time and space, essentially searching for God. We know that both Lewis and Tolkien read these works and were highly influenced, not only by Dunn's work, but Staples. Of time, but not walk through book. One time travel. He had two important times time travel, also written circa 1936, and the Notion Club papers circa 1945. And Stapleton's book is referenced directly within the Notion Club papers. One of the main characters, Raymer, says, I expect I got the idea of traveling from dreams from the old book you lent me, Jeremy, Last Man in London, or some name like that. So when Tolkien says this, okay, we know he we also know again that Lewis was highly influenced by this. Uh, he wrote in a letter that, that what immediately started him to write outside the planet was stapled in his last and first men. And Dunn's work is central to the unfinished tale of space travel or travel to an alternate reality, the Dark Tower. Where this, this short story novella breaks off is about a six page mind numbing description of Dunn's model. And Lewis stopped writing after that. If you've read those six pages, you know why I stopped writing. After that. <laughs> so Lewis and Tolkien were both very well versed in this, albeit wrong, model of theoretical physics that was going around during this time period. What about extraterrestrial life? I don't think we need to really talk about the fact that Lewis uses extraterrestrials in the space trilogy. There's intelligent life on Venus. Paralandra, there's intelligent life on Mars, Malacandra. Tolkien also plays a little bit with extraterrestrial life, but not a lot. Mostly in works that he wrote after Lewis started the space trilogy, including the Akalabeth, the drowning of Anadun, the Notion Club papers, etc. So in his later works, after Lewis had started the space trilogy, Tolkien writes a little bit of space travel in his works as well. So, for example, in several of the works, he says, yeah, there are other planets, but they were claimed to have been created by Melkor or Sauron. So we don't know if that's really true or not. They could just be lying. In other works, he says, well, the elves don't really believe in other worlds. And they might think of it as a, as a what-if scenario. But then in other cases, he goes, no, no, there really were other but they're not really important. The only world that's important is Earth. And if there are worlds, then there might be other dollars. They're working with those other worlds, but again, we only care about our world here. In Ocean Club papers, of course, the main plot traveled back in time to the destruction of Numenor. But as the, the members of the Notion Club are trying to get their feet wet, as it were, and trying to practice travel through time, they also travel through space. And Raymer visits a number of extraterrestrial worlds. And he explains them all just like a sentence or two each. Doesn't really spend a whole lot of time doing that. Okay? On some of these, there is life. On others, there is no life. And on this last world, which has no name, it's a diseased world, a planet with maybe flying men in a tumultuous mess. So Tolkien is probably saying, yeah, if I travel in time by this method of Dunn's, I guess I can travel in space as well, but doesn't really spend a lot of time on it. And one way that Tolkien is very different in his discussion of extraterrestrial life is he flat out says there is no other life in the solar system other than the inhabitants of Earth. And he has his character say, I looked for the solar system, I didn't find life on any other planets. If there is ever life on Mars or Venus, going to be put there by us. In other words, humans are going to colonize those worlds. Very different from Lewis's viewpoint, obviously. But Tolkien has his character say, well, isn't it, isn't it better to say that we're the only people in the solar system? Doesn't it make humanity a more responsible, perilous, lonely venture if we're alone? You may or may not agree with his uh, point of view. Now, one of my favorite quotes from Lewis 
is, is on this slide. Lewis knew the human condition. He knew humans, the good, the bad, the ugly. He knew that people could be very cruel to each other. And he stated on a number of occasions that if humanity ever encounters extraterrestrials, it's going to end badly. If we encounter a group of individuals who, however innocent or amiable, are technologically weaker, it's going to end the way it did for the Native Americans and for other groups that were colonized in the 18th and 19th centuries. And so in several places, Lewis says that the large distance between stars is God's quarantine precautions, not to save us from aliens, but to save the aliens from us. Because humans, as fallen individuals and a fallen species, cannot be trusted, that we will mess it up. Now, there's a letter that struck me very, very, very interesting. You'll see why. It's a 1952 letter to a recent uh, convert to Christianity where Lewis talks about somebody named Hoyle. He says, if Hoyle answers your letter, let the correspondence drop. He is not a great philosopher, and none of my scientific colleagues think much of him as a scientist. If you read the early version of the letters, not the three volumes, but the earlier selected letters of C.S. Lewis, they use a pseudonym. They don't use Hoyle. I don't know why they're trying to protect him, but. but in the three volume set, they mention him by name. And there's a little footnote, and editor Walter Hooper says that this is referring to Sir Fred Hoyle, the Plumian Professor of Astronomy at Cambridge University, and the founder of the Institute of Theoretical Astronomy. Sounds like a harmless enough guy. Lewis directly attacks or makes fun of Hoyle in a couple of occasions in a couple of essays dealing with extraterrestrial life. And I put the entire quotations here for your pleasure. The point is, is that in both of these cases where Lewis is talking about extraterrestrial life, real possibilities of extraterrestrial life, he says, when I was young, scientists said, oh, there probably aren't extraterrestrials. And now all of a sudden, scientists, especially this oil guy, are saying that we should be tripping over extraterrestrials. What gives? So who was Royal and why he was an astrophysicist? And really, a series of radio broadcasts he did for the BBC. The initial broadcast was so popular that it was immediately, the scripts were immediately turned out into a book, and the series was rebroadcast. It was estimated that three, three million people in the UK heard this rebroadcast in 1950. So this was widely heard. Lewis told him they would have heard and they may have read the book as well. In the book version, which again was basically the script from the radio broadcast, Hoyle says, I would say that rather more than a million stars in the Milky Way possess planets on which you might live without undue comfort. So this is one of the things that Lewis is saying, wait a minute, when I was younger, they said there weren't really extraterrestrials, and now you're saying we should be tripping over them. This by itself would not make Lewis upset. This would make Lewis upset. These are quotations from the nature of the universe, from the radio broadcast. Lewis, at the, at the last of the broadcast, went after Christianity with both barrels, making fun of religion generally and Christianity specifically. This is why Lewis told Genia, you know, this don't, if this guy writes back, just let it drop. Don't bother with them. Okay? Lewis was not the only one of the inkling crowd to go after Hoyle. Dorothy Sayers was actually invited to go on the radio and give a rebuttal to Hoyle's comments about Christianity. And it was printed up at, in an article called The Theologian and the Scientist, which you can find online. And Dorothy Sayer not only um, defends Christianity, but goes after scientists. The scientists should beware of too childlike credulity about data. They may be literally data, things given, clues, or red herrings, handed out to him to look as though he had found them. Mic drop, Dorothy Sayer. <laughs> so what did scientists actually think? Did they think that we would be tripping over extraterrestrials, 
or as Lewis said, did they think that life was very rare? Lewis was more or less correct. If you look around 1930, around 1930s or so and earlier, scientists, mainstream scientists thought that habitable worlds, that life was fairly rare in our universe. This is a quote from James Jeans, who in particular was an astronomer whose books Lewis recommended other people read. He says, apart from certain knowledge that life exists on Earth, we have no definite knowledge, whatever, except that at best life may be limited to a tiny fraction of the universe. So why in around 1930s did they think that life was so rare? It's because they thought that planets were really hard to make. We did not really understand how planets were made until probably the 1960s. We still are a little iffy. The pre prevailing model, due to James Jeans, was that the sun was minding its own business. Another star came by, and the gravity between the two stars ripped out material from the sun in a string, which formed the planets. So therefore, according to this model, planets could only form if one star encounters another star, which would be statistically rare, hence planets would be rare. You got it? So that's why Jeans is saying that we really don't think there's a lot of life in the universe. The problem with this is that if you look at the composition of the sun, the sun is about 90% hydrogen and 8% helium and 2% other stuff. And then look at what the earth is made out of. The earth is made out of rock and metal. How do you pull stuff out of something made out of gas and get rock and metal? doesn't work. Okay. So they didn't understand how planets were made in the time of Lewis and Tolkien's youth and even adulthood. So why did Hoyle think that you should be tripping over planets? Because Hoyle had no idea. His idea was that it wasn't that a star came by and ripped out material from the sun, but that the sun was born with a companion star that blew up in a supernova. And in the supernova, it would have created the elements that you need to make rock and metal. Where did our other companion star go? Well, the explosion pushed it the other way, and it just skedaddled and ran off somewhere into the galaxy. <laughs> and then that shrapnel that was left from the exploded star swirled around the sun and made the planets. That was Hoyle's model. So all you needed was an exploding star, you get bright chemistry, and you get plants. It's not quite right, but it's on the right track. Today we know that the sun and the planets and the solar system were all born from a swirling cloud of gas and dust, that the blast from the sun turning on pushed away all the gas into the outer solar system, which is why the inner planets are made out of rock and metal, and the outer planets are made out of ice and gas. We've actually discovered thousands of planets orbiting around other stars. Can you imagine what Lewis would think about this today, uh, what Lewis told him would think about this today. What a conversation, huh, at the bar? <laughs> but now you see why, based on what they knew at the time, Lewis was right at criticizing Hoyle. That Hoyle was using his pet model to make a prediction that was against what other people had thought. And Hoyle knew, and uh, Lewis knew, what the prevailing scientific model was. Well, we know that in the legendarium, Venus is a the mariner in his flying ship with a silver reel stapled to his forehead. Uh, at the end of the time, he's going to whoop some more off butt. Okay? But basically, his job now is to basically go up in the sky, make sure everything's okay, and come back down. You see him around sunrise or sunset, which is what happens with the planet Venus. Twice the morning star and the evening star. Now, Tolkien gets something really wrong here. It's a creative license. I give him, I'll, I'll give him a pass. Uh, when Numenor was built for humans, the humans had to sail out. They had to sail west towards the island. Not too far west, but sail west enough to get to the island. And it said that they followed the star. And that the star, meaning Venus, could be seen shining brightly in the west even in the morning. If you ever get up in the morning and Venus is in the west, go back to bed. You're having a really bad day. <laughs> Because Earth or Venus has shifted position in the solar system. It's impossible. Tolkien obviously knew this. He was being creative. 
But what I'm really interested in is how Tolkien and Lewis describe the surface of Venus. In the Notion Club papers, remember that Raymer says that there's no life in the solar system besides us. Why? Because I've been there. And he describes Venus as a boiling whirl of wind and steam. Okay. He throws in Atlantis reference there because of Tolkien. It's not a good day unless you throw in an Atlantis reference. Okay. And we all know from Paralandra that Lewis represents Venus as a watery paradise with floating islands, vegetation, and its own Adam and Eve. Well, where did these ideas come from? They're not the only ones who wrote, wrote Venus this way. In Olaf Stapledon's Last and First Men in 1930, Venus was a watery world with a very rich ecosystem. And when the Earth is threatened because the moon is going to break up, what do we do? We look around and go, Venus looks good, let's go conquer it. So humans go to Venus, they kill off all the life that lives there, terraform it, and then also do some genetic engineering of humans so that we can now live on this planet. So why did science fiction and fantasy writers in the 1930s and 40s think Venus was this sort of watery, warm paradise? Because we thought it was Earth's twin. It's about the same size as the Earth. It's perennially covered in clouds, so you conveniently can't see the ground. It's closer to the sun, which makes it warmer than us, but it's not maybe too close. Scientists thought it might be a couple hundred degrees there. Maybe life could adapt to that. And Nobel Prize winning chemist Arrhenius said that the humidity was six times that of Earth. Everything on Venus is dripping wet. Something like New York yesterday. <laughs> and in, I, I just pulled a book off my shelf, uh, an astronomy textbook from uh, 1932. And it says, whether there's continents or oceans, we can't say what's there. So you have lots of science fiction stories about so-called old Venus. Paralandra, Last and First Men, Isaac Asimov's Lucky Star Books. And if you haven't read Ray Bradbury's All Summer in a Day, it's an awesome short story. It's about this old Venus model. It's a really good short story. Problem is, there was absolutely no evidence of there being water in, in Venus's atmosphere at the time. But Fred Hoyle had an explanation. You ready for this one? It's called Hoyle's Oil. <laughs> we knew that Venus had a carbon dioxide rich atmosphere. <laughs> He said that under the right conditions, the carbon dioxide could form hydrocarbons, which would rain from the sky. And so, this is a quote from Hoyle, the oceans may well be oceans of oil. Venus is probably endowed beyond the dreams of the religious Texas oil king. I know that theme song is now playing in your head. Thank you later. Well, we learned in the 1960s another inconvenient truth that Venus is not our twin sister, it is our evil, ugly stepsister Griselda with a bad personality. It has a surface pressure 90 times that of Earth. It has a surface temperature hot enough to melt lead. And the clouds are made out of sulfuric acid clouds, or sulfuric acid droplets. So nothing can live on Venus. It is dry, it is volcanic, and science fiction writers had to do a hard right turn and start writing Venus in a different way, or ignoring the sun. So once again, Tolkien and Lewis are accurately reflecting the scientific knowledge of their day in writing Venus as being warmer and possibly wetter and possibly inhabitable. All right, meteorites. Just a little bit of terminology. A meteor is a flash of light caused by a falling meteorite. A meteorite is a rock that falls to the ground. A meteor is the flash of light you see as it burns up. There are three kinds. There are those that are made out of iron with a little bit of nickel. The largest of these is the Hoba in Namibia. They have not even dug the whole thing out of the ground. It's like 90 tons. There are stony meteorites made out of stones. <laughs> and there are stony irons made out of stone and iron. Now, I've talked elsewhere about the meteoritic sword of Turin Turambar, Anglicel, one of the two meteoritic swords forged by Aeol, the Dark Elf, which was made out of a rock that fell from the sky. It was reforged by Turin as the Black Sword. And it's sometimes said that the unique pattern that you find in iron meteorites might have been mimicked in the so-called Damascus steel. For the Game of Thrones fans, the uh, Valerian steel may be part of this. I actually have a piece of iron meteorite that I'll pass around that has this weird pattern. You're, feel free to take it out of the bag and hold it if you want. 
So why did Tolkien call this a black blade if we polish it in silver? Well, as a stony meteorite falls through, it actually burns, it gets crispy on the outside, and you get something called a fusion crust. And Tolkien might have been confusing this. So I have a stony meteorite with a fusion crust on it, and you guys can hold that too. Now, what's interesting is that Tolkien in the Notion Club papers, again, when they're trying out this method of traveling through space and time, one of the first things that Raymer does is he tries to relive the history of a meteorite that fell locally. And so he sort of does a Vulcan mind meld with his meteorite somehow, <laughs> and relives its torturous, painful fall to Earth. And, the th and this is something I'm still working on. One of the interesting things is that Raymer says, I wanted to do this because I wonder if the meteorite could have come from Mars. Where did you get that idea from? C.S. Lewis also wrote a poem about a meteorite called The Meteorite, published in 1946. And the part that's in the box is of interest to me. All that is Earth has once been sky down from the sun of old she came, or from some star that traveled by too close to his entangling flame. Think back a few minutes ago, that model of planet formation in the 1930s and 40s, a star coming and ripping material off the sun. Again, Lewis is recycling some of his scientific knowledge of the day in describing where this meteorite might have come from, might have been ripped off of the sun. There's another famous poem written a couple decades earlier, Star Stone Boat by Robert Frost, where a meteorite accidentally gets picked up and is put in a stone wall. And an interesting line I highlighted there, that we can't compare this meteorite to such resorts of life as Mars or Earth. Possibility of life on Mars. The Kalevala, which you might know is one of Tolkien's obsessions. There is a meteorite that falls, that is noted. And here is this line at the bottom that I've sort of highlighted here. And to the Earth beneath descended the meteorite. Of the moon tis perhaps a fragment, of the sun perchance a segment. That we can't tie with the modern idea. So the fact that this idea that meteorites may have come from the sun or the moon is perhaps an ancient idea. But again, why did Tolkien specifically say Mars? Was he just nodding to Lewis and saying, well, Lewis wrote about Mars, I'm just going to throw Mars in? You have to understand that people did not know where meteorites came from at this time. Some people thought that they came from the moon. Some people thought they came from the asteroid belt. As far as I can tell, and I just started into this, the only reference to Mars that was in any of this literature was a, a paper written by a scientist from Harvard who said that meteorites come from a body that was originally the size of Mars that was broken apart. Could Tolkien have read this and misunderstood it? I don't know. Again, work in progress. Today we now know that there are some meteorites from Mars. These are called the Sticks, okay? The sugar types, the Naclites, and the Chazignites. We have about 60 meteorites that are actually pieces of Mars. Something hit Mars, splashed off some Mars rock, traveled through space, landed on it. So, Tolkien can now say he had the last laugh because some meteorites do come from Mars. People didn't really think about that back in the 1940s. But. but one thing they were thinking about was where the moon came from. And again, in this uh, legendarium of Middle Earth, the canon is that the sun and the moon did not exist until the death of the two trees by Morgoth and, and Ungoliant. And the last flower and the last fruit were placed in vessels and hoisted into the sky by Varda to provide light for Middle Earth. But again, over the course of his life, Tolkien didn't like this non-scientific explanation and tried revising his cosmology to take it more in line with the science of the day. What we need to understand is what was Tolkien trying to draw upon? At the time, there were three ideas as to where the moon came from. None of them were right. They are sometimes 
sometimes called the sister, daughter, and wife, or one night stand, or concubine, or depending on <laughs> writing it. Sister model says that basically the earth and the moon form side by side out of the same stuff. The daughter model, which is due to George Darwin, the son of Charles, says that the early earth was spinning so fast that a piece of it just got thrown out and became the moon. So the moon's our daughter, we gave birth to it. And then the wife model says that, that uh, it was just the moon was cruising by one day, got a little too close, and we captured it into a permanent relationship. Okay. That's what Tolkien is drawing upon. And if you go through these different models that he proposes during and after the Lord of the Rings, you can match them up precisely to one of these three models. Right? So in one of these stories, Melkor wants the earth, can't have it, can't have it, has a hissy fit and rips part of the earth off to form the moon. Okay? That's the daughter model. In another one of these, the Valar and the Melkor have a fight. And the Valar need to build a station so they can watch Melkor, so they make the moon out of either earth stuff or sun stuff. Well, if they make the moon out of earth stuff, then it's the daughter. If they make it out of sun stuff, it is the mother. Again, model. And then in one of these essays, Tolkien says, well, we really don't know how the, how the Valar did it. Some say it was made out of the earth. Some say it was made out of other stuff. So it could be in the daughter or the sister model. But he's drawing upon the models of the dead. So I know you're all great to know where, how the moon actually was formed. Uh, the true answer is we're not 100% sure. But the best model we have is that a Mars-sized object got close to the earth, did a glancing glow, some of the debris, that's a mix of earth material and this other object form the moon, sometimes called the impact trigger hypothesis or the big whack. I like big whack. Okay. Uh, based on the computer models, it works. It explains how the moon's composition is similar to us but not identical. So that's the best idea we have of where the moon actually came. What about Lewis and the death of the sun? If you've read the time, the time Machine carefully, written in 1895, he takes the time machine as far into the future as he possibly can to witness the death of the sun. And he describes the sun as a huge red-hot dome that obscures nearly a tenth part of the darkling heavens. Modern readers, and I've seen this in critic critique, modern readers will look at this and go, oh, that's describing the sun dying as a red giant, which it will. This is 1895. Red giants had not been known yet. So the critics, who are, think they're all smart by saying, this is the astronomy of 1895, are wrong. In 1895, they thought that all stars form as these big, hot, blue things. They shrink under gravity and die as small, red dwarfs. That is what Wells is describing. The sun has shrunk to a red dwarf. Why does it look so big? because the Earth has spiraled it closer to it. And if you read the story, it actually says that in the story. Okay. A couple decades later, around the time that Lewis and Tolkien are writing, this is how we thought stars evolve. They start as red giants. They shrink to form something that's hot and blue, which then continues to shrink and cool down to a red giant and then shrinks further to compress into something called a white dwarf. This is a diagram that I took from, again, Sir James G. Vine in 1931. This is what Tolkien and Lewis would have been taught. This is what they would have known. Okay? This is in all popular books. In Olaf Stapleton's novels, we see him using this. He has the sun ultimately dying, shrinking into a white dwarf, and Stapleton says that when the sun was young, a red giant would shrink down to size to that. Lewis realized this, and he does a very good quote of this in the lecture is theology poetry. He says, the sun will cool all sun cool. So Lewis would compare this. But around 1950, we actually realize what really is going to happen. This is really how the sun is going to evolve. The sun collapsed from a cloud of gas and dust. It formed its yellow 
middling size it has today. Red giants represent the death of the sun, not the birth of the sun. And then after puffing off the outer layers into space, it will collapse into a white dwarf. So as of 1950, we realize that red giants are the ends of stars, not the beginnings of stars. They have a paradigm shift in science. Who figured this out? Fred Hoyle. <laughs> the guy that Lewis doesn't like. But Lewis used his science in the Narnia Chronicles. <laughs> you don't have to like someone to use their science, apparently. If you read carefully, in two places, The Magician's Nephew and The Last Battle, the deaths of stars are accurately described as dying as a red giant. Remember that Lewis knew that some of his science was wrong and didn't care. Why then did he take care to make it right in these circumstances? I don't have the answer to that. I find it fascinating that he's using the science as someone that he detests. He somehow thought this was wonderful. Okay? So Charn, you go there, big bloated dying red star. At the end of Narnia, when the giant blows the horn and the stars fall from the sky as meteors, we have again this giant, bloated, red giant star, which the giant squishes down to a point. That's gravity collapsing it down to a white dwarf. Why did Lewis put all of this science into that story? I wish I knew. That's one thing I would like to ask him if I could like get my time machine and go back and ask him. Why? So coming full circle, <laughs> this is one of the drafts of that quote that I started this talk with from Tolkien, that he liked astronomy and botany, but he claimed that he was stupid at arithmetic, which is really surprising for someone who came up with all these intricate calendars. Now, um, how, um, how many of you know that the chronology of the Lord of the Rings is done by lunar days? It's been written about. Okay? It's very well done. It's perfectly well done. If you cheated and based it off an actual calendar you had on your desk, which we know Tolkien did because we have his notes, thanks to his son Christopher. The phases of the moon and the hobbit are an unholy mess. They don't work, which is really crazy because the phases of the moon are really important to the story. Right? The moon runes, Durin's dead. Tolkien got it wrong, and he knew he got it wrong. He went back later and tried to fix it, and he couldn't. For example, if you look at the phase of the moon in the troll scene, and then the phase of the moon in Rivendell, there's absolutely no way the chronology works. And Tolkien knew it, and as I said, tried to fix it and could not get it to work. This is what happens when he's freehanding it and not using a desktop calendar. He also gets the phase of the moon wrong in Lake Town. Remember that it's a thin waxing crescent on Durin's day. Two days later, all of a sudden, you can see the moon in the east at sunset. It should still be in the west. Tolkien got it wrong. He should know this. Sometimes Tolkien scholars don't, they're so into it, they don't even realize it. Uh, this is from John Ratliff's The History of the Hobbit, where he's actually quoting Tolkien notes about the phases of the moon, and John Ratliff didn't realize that the answer was right in front of his face until I pointed it out to him. I go, John, Tolkien's using the phases of the moon as a 28-day cycle. Not 28 days, it's 29 and a half. And John's like, why didn't I see that? So it's not just Tolkien. This is actually a common misconception. So when people say, I know when Durin's Day really is in Middle Earth, I go, no, you don't. <laughs> It's physically impossible because Tolkien was using a 28-day lunar cycle. Now, to be fair, C.S. Lewis also didn't like math. Actually, uh, Parallel Dimension Tale, The Dark Tower, was never finished 
Remember I said that it sort of ends with six pages of mind-numbing discussion of the Dunn model of, of time travel. Walter Hooper says that, yeah, Lewis stopped there because he couldn't figure out what the heck he was doing because the math was, was giving him a headache. So maybe Lewis stopped this really cool story because, again, he got himself too tied up in his weak spot in the math. Now, if you think that math education is only a problem today, I just love this little quote from the 1901 meeting of the British Association of Education section on the teaching of math. And here the teachers are complaining that the exam system was imposed on the teachers from the outside and that the teachers were not to blame with the whole mess of the math education system. <laughs> the same thing happens today. <coughs> more changes in our state's the same. So what are we to take from all of this? I think what we should take from this is not just that Lewis and Tolkien knew a lot of science, some of it correct, some of it wrong, and that they care to varying degrees to get the science right. But I think what we should take away from this is the crucial interplay between science and the arts. Today we talk a lot about STEM education. And there's another paradigm shift that's happening now called STEAM education, which is combining the arts into science, especially because good science requires creativity. And where do you get a lot of creativity from? arts. So I think that Lewis and Tolkien show us the benefits of a STEAM education over a STEM education. And I would like to think that Lewis and Tolkien have my back on this point. Thank you very much. correspondence and they're making fun of they're poking a little bit of fun at Lewis in there, but they're poking fun at science fiction saying that these ways of traveling in rocket ships to other planets are, are BS. That's why this dream thing is much better. So so and you do know that the whole idea about that about who's gonna write the time travel story and the and the space travel story the, the so famous that he was Tolkien. They had stuff. I kind of think Tolkien just grabbed time travel and Lewis picked the bigger show. I don't really, I can't really see that being a complete um, chance. And that they were going to go off and write these stories because they didn't like the quality of what was out there. So the labels themselves, I don't think were so much of it. It's, they were more about the quality overall as to what was out there. And that sometimes when people try to make these, whatever you call them, science fiction stories too technologically precise, they weren't very good. I don't know, that's the way we answer the question. Yes? Hey, uh, a, a name I sort of heard orbiting around here that you've never said is Frank Tipler, who has done a lot of like, close timeline like this work in relativity, and about 20 years ago wrote a book called The Physics of Immortality. Yeah. 
Is that in this pipeline somewhere? <laughs> a tippler. Yeah. Um, the mainstream view is that tippler sort of tippled a little too much. <laughs> <laughs> science and bad theology at the same time. So, but there are a number of people, Frank Tipler being one of them. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So did they dislike oil because it was critical view of Christianity? I have no I, I have no evidence about Tolkien saying of anything about oil. Uh, in terms of Lewis, I think that the anti Christianity was a huge part of it. And that this whole idea of the uh, changing view of extraterrestrials was a nice way for Hoyle to dig in on him. What's interesting is that that, very, that first essay, my mom puts his about oh boy, they said there were no extraterrestrials, and now Hoyle comes out and says we're tripping over them. That was written the same year that Hoyle got the big promotion to Plumian professor. And at that point, Lewis was now working at Cambridge, where Hoyle was. So he was a colleague. I would love to have been a fly on the wall of those two passing in the hallway. <laughs> I don't know if they technically met, but it's, I, and Hoyle got a lot of attention. Hoyle was a bit of a jerk. I probably missed out on winning a Nobel Prize for work on stellar evolution because he was a jerk. It was given to one of his colleagues instead. So there were a lot of people who didn't like Fred Hoyle, which would have put Lewis in good company. But I, I I would bet that the anti-Christianity remarks were a huge, huge part of that, just based on the, the letter, the genie of goals, if nothing else. Yeah? I was just going to say, um, Christianity, points out that scientists tend to be very accurate in their own speciality and very inaccurate outside of that. And mm -hmm. letter, the, that original letter, is, is that uh, Lewis is coming flat out and saying his own colleagues don't think much of him, which is not exactly true. Merlin. the science of the day. There were a number of professional scientists and others who wrote bestseller, popular level books like Sir James Jeans. So it was probably a reasonable assumption that many of you, that Lewis would have realized that many of his readers would have read Jeans' books. And given the popularity of Paul's radio broadcasts and his books, even though he didn't like foil, it was a good bet that the average person would have heard of a giant and would have heard of foil. So it, it's, it's a different, I think it's a bit different from what we have today. I think if you ask today, what would we expect the average person today to know? It, it, what we surveys that basically say that a quarter of the American adult population still thinks that the sun goes around the earth. Well, 
What year? When? I might have thought about, again, the solutions, Einstein's equations that would bend space and time to find shortcuts. I mean, it's Earth orbit for wormholes and stuff. You know, like I said, Girdle had, well, that was 49, got the... So I think that in that case, I think it might have just been a fantastical what-if idea, sort of like a scientific magic carpet. It was also a time of mainstream concern with time travel, which two bestsellers in England were Marcus Square, in America you had Portrogeny, both uh, in the 1930s, that were both about time travel, and they were published as mainstream, and they were read, uh, everyone read them. And a lot of the, the, pulp, the pulp magazines also were very much into both space travel yeah. and time travel. That, other extreme. These were you know, both published by mainstream publishers and were mainstream bestsellers. Yeah. Yeah, um, I had a thought about the uh, why Why did he try to make the science right in the Narnia books where he didn't care about it so much in the space trilogy. And I'm wondering if because they were children's books, he felt more of a responsibility to give them more accurate information and, and not think, you know, the readers just going to accept this, even though they know the real science, like the adults would read in the space trilogy. It's really interesting, but you have to, my counterpoint would be, then why does he make it a flat world? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, yeah, he gets that right, but then Narnia is a flat world. It's a very it's medieval, true. geocentric true. world, and then he plunks yeah. in this modern astrophysics. It just, just strikes me as very peculiar. It is weird. And what's interesting is that e even though the last, even though the last battle is obviously the last book, and yeah. the magician's nephew is the quote first book, they were written back yeah. to back. Mm -hmm. So you can see why that idea would be in both books. It's not that he had this idea that he carried over a decade or something. Is he wrote those books back to back pretty much? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, maybe the answer is what Tolkien felt about is not your books in general. They were such a hard mythology. So, so you're going to have some science and you're going to have some medieval stuff. But I got something more important to do here than, you know, worry about, uh, you know, credibility on, on this level. Uh, you know, I'm trying to get a, a, a theological yeah, message yeah. across. So that right. So why do you need red giants to have you through? I, it, it, yeah. But you're right, Tolkien is a hodgepodge. Mm -hmm. No, C.S. Lewis. Yeah. Oh, no. But I'm saying uh, Tolkien well, calling, calling Lewis yeah. a hodgepodge. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It is. That's, that is what it is. That's, that's Lewis. I mean, you yeah. just want to go ahead. Uh, yeah. God bless him. I think the uh, steam model of arts and integration is absolutely right. And I'm just curious if in your world, uh, in academic world, you come up with, with a lot of resistance to that, uh, especially scientifically speaking. Yes. Like yes. Like mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, in a, I'm, in, I'm in a STEM school. Uh, school of Engineering, Science, and Technology. So I am in CEST. It's not even a school. <laughs> <laughs> Acronyms are bad. <laughs> but uh, yeah, my dean is an engineer. He has a very engineering way of thinking about it. Sometimes even seeing the difference between engineering and science is an issue, let alone the arts. And I get a lot of personal resistance from my colleagues about the work I do about Tolkien and this, because they, they don't understand what this is. This is what is the stuff you're doing. They don't understand that it integrates the science with the arts and the literature and showing how to really understand it, you need to look at both sides of it. There are some people who are coming around to it, but it's a slow, slow battle. Slow battle. I was just gonna say getting back to um Boys of the Dawn
Hodge, Hodge. I, I just don't want to do a comment before we, we end uh, what you had said. I, I teach freshman composition uh, at the college level. Um, and you would think from my department, the English department, we would be more open to the unifying. We're trying to be a STEM school. I don't know if we're actually use that term. Um, but no, I'm forbidden to teach any creative writing, forbidden to teach any fiction. So as a retaliation, I, I teach Neil Gaiman's article, Why Do We Need Libraries? Which she talks about this idea of how creativity is vital in technology, how creativity and science fiction and fantasy is needed. And he even talks about what, what you had talked about, mm -hmm. that for writing children's stories and fantasy, he said you have a responsibility to get it correct, to get your details right. So I, I don't understand why, but it's not seen as utilitarian, even in English. Teach them just what they need to know to pass their math courses and nothing else. Mm -hmm. So, but, um. in response to that, are people and presenters like Ijo Haku like that doing anything to change that a little bit? Like popular voices, scientists who are approaching things on a popular creative basis? Um, I would say that Neil deGrasse Tyson perhaps a bit. Uh, but again, the problem with Neil deGrasse Tyson, in, in the New Cosmos, he gets some of the history wrong. Mm -hmm. So, I think that there's a nod to it, but if they're going to do it, they should do it right. He's uh, a hack so compared to think, you. At least they're thinking about it. At least they're thinking about it. So, it's slow, but I think, I think mm -hmm. we all have to hold hands and uh, and we all have to work together. And I think that parents need to put pressure on the school to say, we value this. And, and show examples of people who were writers who, you know, like Tolkien, he's a philologist, he considered himself a scientific philologist, he was very creative. And just show benefits to our children for not having one or the other, but having both and having them integrated together. Okay? All right, so thank you very much. And I think